Hello, Crosswalk family. It's the second weekend in December. Christmas is all around us. And we wanna greet you and thank you for joining us for our online services this month. I do wanna let you know that we are having a Christmas Eve service outdoors. So you can go to our website, get more information on that and sign up if you would like to come. Dress warm. 21 Days of Prayer is going to begin in January. It's a collaboration between Crosswalk Church, Sunnyvale Christian School. We're getting our whole campus together to pray every day for 21 days. Scripture, devotion, some worship, and even the opportunity to watch online so that you can participate with us together. Today we are gonna be blessed with hearing Gilbert Foster preach for us. But before that, I want to introduce the Crosswalk Kids presenting the Christmas story. The Christmas story by the Crosswalk Kids. Long ago, about 2000 years, when King Herod ruled Judea, now part of Israel, God sent the angel Gabriel to a young woman who lived in the northern town of Nazareth. The girl's name was Mary, and she was engaged to marry Joseph. The angel Gabriel said to Mary, Please be with you. God is with you and is pleased with you. Mary was very surprised by this and wondered what the angel meant. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid. God has been very kind to you. You will become pregnant by the Holy Spirit and give birth to a baby boy, and you will call him Jesus. He will be God's own son, and his kingdom will never end. And we are afraid for you. Gabriel, the angel, also told Mary that her cousin Elizabeth, who everyone thought was too old to have kids, would have a baby boy who God chose to prepare the way for Jesus. Mary said goodbye to her family and friends and went to visit her, her cousin Elizabeth and her husband Zachariah. Elizabeth was very happy to see Mary. She knew that Mary had been chosen by God to be the mother of his son. An, an, an angel had already told Zachariah that Elizabeth's baby would prepare people to welcome Jesus. He was to be called John. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then returned home to Nazareth. Joseph was worried when he found out that Mary was expecting a baby before their marriage had taken place. He wondered if he should put off the wedding altogether. Then an angel appeared to Joseph in his dream and said, Do not be afraid to have Mary as your wife. The angel explained that Mary had been chosen to be the mother of his son and told Joseph that the baby would be named Jesus, which means Savior because he would save all people. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel had told him to do and took Mary as his wife. At this time, the land where Mary and Joseph lived was part of the Roman Empire. The Roman Emperor Augustus wanted a list of all the people in the empire to make sure they paid for paid their taxes. He ordered everyone to return to the land their families originally came from and entered their names in the census there. Mary and Joseph traveled a long way, about 70 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem, because that's where Joseph's family came from. Most people walked, but some lucky people had a donkey to help carry the goods needed for the journey. Joseph and Mary traveled very slowly because Mary's baby was due to be born soon. When they reached Bethlehem, they had problems finding somewhere to stay. So many people had come to register their names in the census that every house was full and every bed was taken in all of the guest rooms. The only place to stay that they could find was with the animals. People normally slept on a raised or upper level with the animals below to give them extra warmth. 
and so in a place when an animal slept, Mel gave voice to Jesus, the Son of God. In those days, it was custom to wrap newborn babies tightly in a long cloth called swaddling clothes. Jesus' bed was a manger that the animals ate their hay from. In the hills and fields outside Bethlehem, shepherds looked after their sheep through the long night. As the new day began, suddenly an angel appeared before them and the glory of God shone around them. The shepherds were very, very scared. In your bed, the little bed, and for you, for you, and everyone today, and get caught in, and give you a big bun for you. A little bun, a baby, and a baby. Then many more angels appeared lighting up the sky. The shepherds heard them praising God, singing. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to everyone on earth. When the angels had gone, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem to see what has happened. So the shepherds went to Bethlehem and found Mary and Joseph. The baby Jesus was lying in a manger as they had been told. When they saw him, they told everyone what the angel had said, and everyone who heard the story were astonished. The shepherds returned to their sheep, praising God for sending his son to be a savior. When Jesus was born, a brand new bright star appeared in the sky. Some wise men in faraway countries saw the star and guessed what it meant. There are very clever men that studied the stars and had read in very old writings that a new star would appear when a great king was born. They set out to find the new king and bring him gifts. The wise men followed the star towards the country of Judea, and when they got to the capital called Jerusalem, they began to ask people, where is a child who is born to be the king of the Jews? Herod, the king of Judea, heard this and made him very angry to think that someone might be going to take his place as king. As king. Herod sent for the wise men to come to him. He told them to go on following the star until they had found the baby king. He said, When you have found him, let me know where he is so that I can go and worship him. But Herod did not tell them that he really had an evil plan in mind to kill the new king. The wise men followed the star towards Bethlehem and seemed to stop and shine directly down upon the place where Jesus was. The wise men entered the house and found Jesus with Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The wise men were warned by God in a dream not to go back to Herod, so they returned home a different way. After the wise men had gone, an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, the angel said. Take Jesus and Mary and escape to Egypt, for Herod is going to search for Jesus to kill him. So Joseph took Mary and Jesus back to Egypt, where they stayed until King Herod died. When Herod had realized that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was furious and gave orders to kill all the boys aged two or younger in Bethlehem and the surrounding area. This was to try to kill the new king, as his plan to find the location of the new king using the wise men had failed. After Herod had died, Joseph had another dream in which an angel appeared to him. The angel said, Get up, take Jesus and Mary, and go back to Israel, for those who are trying to kill Jesus are dead. So Joseph got up, took Jesus and Mary, and went back to Israel. But when he heard that Herod's son was now king of Judea, he was afraid to go there. So instead, they went to Galilee and lived in their old town of Nazareth. Merry Christmas from Crosswalk Church Kids!
Great being with you this morning, Sunnyvale, uh, even though it's through video. Uh, I thought I was going to be able to see you before the year end, but dang COVID. So we're virtual and it is a great privilege to be given an opportunity to preach again. So come January, I'll be carrying the majority of the preaching as your interim senior pastor, but not full time. And so in January, I will preach three or four Sundays, de depending if we're online fully or not online fully. And then in February, March and April, I'll carry 50% of the preaching. And to help fill the pulpit will be some of Crosswalk staff, along with some Crosswalk people, Angel and Ed and also Matthew. And we'll also have some GHC pastors, Growing Healthy Churches pastors, speak from time to time. And folks, It'll be good, but it will be different. Pastor John retires and Crosswalk Church enters a period of transition and transition always means change. So uh, I'm going to speak more into this come January. But what's important is this. The pulpit is not about personality. The pulpit is about coming to hear from God through his word and by his spirit, whether online or in person, and no matter the messenger. Think about it, you know, be wary of placing too much importance on the messenger. You know, God came as a baby, Christmas, and in the past, <laughs> he's even spoken through an ass, okay? So every Sunday, God's word will be opened and God's truth will be proclaimed, and where two or three are gathered, virtually or in person, Christ is there. And when Christ is there, that is enough. It will be great. And we very much look forward to seeing what God's going to do come 2021. Well, other great news that happened this week. Uh, the drug company Pfizer began their vaccination program in the UK and it's about to happen here in America and uh, you'll be able to soon with the vaccination hug your family members and not worry about social distancing which come to think of it as somebody from Britain nah that's maybe not so good news 
social distancing is the way to do it, folks, okay? Uh, however, I'm not taking the Pfizer vaccination until I know what the silent P is up to. <laughs> okay? Every year, every year, pastors get to preach the Christmas story. The amazing story of the birth of Jesus. It's the season called Advent and it lasts for four Sundays. So that means every year a pastor or preacher has to come up with not one, but four messages about the story, the birth of Jesus. And it's a story that you know really, really well. Like I've been a pastor preacher for over 25 years. That's over a hundred different ways to tell the story that you know. Pastor John, I think he's been preaching since like the time of Noah. How many Christmas messages has he preached? I mean, think about it. The two times a year when most people come to church or listen to sermons would be Christmas and Easter. And like both these times, everyone knows the story. A baby's born called Jesus. There are angels and shepherds and wise men and elves. And then on Easter, when every year Jesus rises from the dead and he skips away with the Easter bunny. Christmas, Easter, making it different, understanding it differently. And on top of everything, this year is COVID year, a tougher than usual year. And that got me thinking, that got me thinking. With the help of the writings of Richard Horsley and Thomas Cahill, I want us to place Christmas 2020 in the toughness of the first Christmas. Often Christmas helps us gloss over things. Maybe it's the Christmas music that we like or the lights or the ideas of chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Or maybe it's the reliving the memories of past Christmases and the traditions we do that keep Christmas special. But this Christmas, COVID Christmas, we don't want to skirt real issues about how life really is. We don't want to just avoid what's really happening. And not just because of COVID, but for many people, Christmas is not the hap happiest season of all. Awkward family gatherings or missing family members or empty kitchen cupboards or arguing kids or <laughs> let's not mention the in-laws. For every person who Christmas brings out the best of life, there's somebody else and Christmas brings out everything that's wrong with the world. And it's, it's what's wrong with the world that is our starting point for this year's Christmas story and my one preach in your Christmas Advent series. At the time of the first Christmas, what happened around year zero, <laughs> you can figure that out later, the world was ruled by one of the Caesars, Caesar Augustus. The first Caesar was Julius Caesar, a ruler of an empire, inventor of a salad. <laughs> uh, and from there, Julius Caesar passed on rule to his adopted son, Caesar Augustus, the first emperor. And Caesar Augustus came to power in roughly 20 BC, and then he ruled until 14 AD. And so the Christmas story happens around his time of ruling. And it was a time when the whole world was ruled by this one man, Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus believed that his father, Julius, was God who had ascended to heaven. And so he, Julius uh, Caesar Augustus, referred to himself as the son of God. And they sang hymns to him, worshipping him as the son of God. Caesar Augustus had high priests who would offer incense to Caesar Augustus. And through his priests, they believed you could receive forgiveness of sins. Caesar Augustus saw himself as the savior of the world who had come to reunite heaven and, heaven and earth. He was the embodiment of the good news. You're picking up on some 
familiar Christian language? So in the real Christmas story, get your minds around this, the whole world was united from England to India. And notice I didn't say Scotland because the Romans didn't get us, okay? They looked over the wall, Hadrian's Wall. <laughs> they saw a bunch of Scottish men wearing skirts. We call them kilts. And they said, well, we ain't going up there. So the world was then England to India. And it was ruled by the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was ruled by Caesar Augustus. So you paid tribute to Caesar Augustus. And they slaughtered anyone who stood in their way. When Caesar's soldiers came to your village, they would ask, is Caesar your Lord? And you would reply, yes, Caesar is our Lord. And if you refused, they killed you. There are records of one of Caesar's generals, Cassius, who enslaved 30,000 people because they refused to say Caesar is Lord. So let's imagine your village. In walks the Roman soldiers. If you refused to bow down, they would slaughter you and they would take the rest of your village and make them their slaves, women, kids, grandparents. There's a report in one writing of the city of Sepphoris, not far from Nazareth. And they refused to accept Caesar and the Roman troops captured and burned the city, making slaves of most, but crucifying on the spot about 2,000 people. They carried out a torched earth policy and pity any city or village that stood in their way. Reports on one day of 15,000 people being slain in the city of Jaffia in just six hours of fighting. And Jaffia is only two miles outside of Nazareth. This was Caesar's rule of peace, Pax Romana. And you're, you're starting to track with the story. In the name of peace, he would slaughter and massacre to control the world. And if you did bow down, you would then be part of the Roman Empire and you would pay taxes and your taxes would go to Caesar so he could pay for more troops to do more conquering to control more of the world. Now, as the empire advanced, how did Caesar keep control when he was a nine-month journey away? Well, the answer was he found a local king, a king who could rule on his behalf. And in the land of Israel, now controlled by the Roman Empire, in walks to the Christmas story, a local king called Herod, who was a distant cousin to Santa Claus, which is a kind of neat twist in the whole story. That, that's a joke. <laughs> Herod was an absolute warrior who slaughtered everyone in his path. You're sensing the trend. And basically, his job was to keep Caesar happy. And as long as he did what Caesar wanted, he could stay in control of Israel. And Herod ruled Israel for 40 years. So Caesar ruled the world and took taxes to pay for his empire. Herod ruled locally, and he also took taxes not so much to pay for his empire, but he began a rebuilding program of building palaces. And historians write that at that day, people were paying in excess of 80 to 90% in taxes. <laughs> and we think California is bad. Imagine, imagine that all you had was a plot, a small plot of land that had been passed down through your family. A hundred years, 200 years. At this time, that land was taken off you. And all you could do was beg or scavenge, just trying to survive. So here's the story. Caesar Augustus ruled. If you didn't bow down to him, you died. Herod rules locally. If you didn't bow down to him, you died. He killed his own son because he was suspicious of him. He had 15 of the most respected Jewish leaders kept prisoner until the day that he died so that they would, be, they would be murdered on the day that he died. And he did that so that on the day that he died, they would be guaranteed mourning at his death. Death 
taxes, slavery, oppression. Now, the Jews believed that they were God's people. God had given them this land. He would provide for them. And so what developed at this time was a deep sense of despair, a profound sense of fatalism. Is, is Caesar always going to rule? Is Herod always going to be on the throne? They just kill and kill and kill and the rich get richer and the poor, they get poorer and poorer and those who have, they get more and the normal everyday person, 99% of us, we have less and less and less to understand the Christmas story. This is the history. Forget the the quaint Christmas card scene of a star and angels and shepherds and a manger and a sty and still the night. This was violent and brutal, hard. Within the Jewish people developed a profound sense, sense of doubt. God, if you're so good, why is Herod still on the throne? God, if you're so good, why is Caesar claiming to be God and getting away with it? God, if you're so good, why cancer? God, if you're so good, why divorce? Their questions were the questions of history. God, if you're so good and I try to do the right thing, why is this happening? And so, as we blur the lines between their Christmas story and our Christmas story, their questions are maybe your questions. God, if you're so good, why did I lose my house? God, if you're so good, why did I lose my job? God, if, if you're so good, why this diagnosis? God, where are you? In the first Christmas story, a man called Simeon enters the picture. And I love this line in Luke's gospel. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Waiting to enter into the Christmas story and not just drive by one more nativity scene and hear one more Christmas carol, but to enter into it, to own it, is to enter into a whole nation of people waiting. And they're asking God, how long? How long, God, until you show up? Where are you? How long? And some of you know this question. God, where are you? How long, God? So I want to take a moment. I want us to stop partway through this message and I want to invite you to reflect on this question of waiting. What are you waiting? What are you waiting for? And what hasn't God done yet? So I don't know where you are just now, maybe in the lounge, maybe in the bedroom, maybe. Just for a moment, pause and just reflect. We're going, to, we're, we're going to wait for a moment. What is it you've been waiting for God to do and he hasn't done yet? Just, just quiet in your heart and ask yourself that question. Just take a moment. And God, as we sit in the waiting, we don't just sit thinking through what it is that we're waiting for you to do, but we come to you and we pray that you would intervene, that you would deliver or rescue or redeem or renew, that you would act. I, I don't know what people have said they're waiting for God, but I know 
in the human heart, we're often waiting because we live with disappointment and brokenness. But we believe in a redeemer, in a savior, somebody who saves and moves. And so whatever thought, whatever part of life people have reflected on in these quiet moments, we ask, God, that you would come and that you would deliver, that, that, that the waiting would be over and that you would move. That's our Christmas prayer, God. So, so this is the world around year zero. Despair, how long, God? God, where are you? And this is where the Christmas story picks up. Out of nowhere, an angel appears to a young Jewish girl. And Jewish girls were normally given in marriage around the ages of 13 or 14, so junior high. And I wanted you to turn in your scriptures this morning to Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. And I want to read a little bit of the scripture here. Uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 30. Listen to these words. The angel said to her, this is to Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. The, these last words there, uh, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. It's, a, it's at this time and in this place that an angel appears. And the angel doesn't appear to a Roman general or to a politician, not even to a priest or to a pastor, but to a young Jewish girl. Now, Mary, Mary is very practical girl, and uh, she's, she's done that class in biology. Uh, you will be with child, uh, uh, how come? Um, you know, uh, some stuff hasn't happened yet. Oh, wow, this just doesn't make sense. And the angel says, well, Mary, Mary, you don't understand. You're going to get pregnant by the Spirit of God. And Mary's like, oh, right, okay, well, that clears up, you know. <laughs> that happens all the time, you know. My friends and I were just talking about this the other day as we walked home from school. And, and then there are several different translations of how the angel and Mary's interaction ends. And I love how Thomas Cahill puts it, verse 38. Uh, Mary said, here I am, the Lord's servant. Let's get on with it. This is the Christmas story. But isn't it so bizarre? And that's why it's so powerful. It captures our imagination because it's God showing up and using the most unexpected kinds of people. God shows up and says, I haven't forgotten. But he shows up in the most unexpected ways. In the womb of a teenager. In the voice of the poor. In the eyes of the migrant. In the helplessness of the patient in the faith of an elderly gentleman. God shows up and says to Mary, 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 Caesar's gone down. Mary, Mary, Herod's had his day. Mary, Mary, you're going to have a baby and call him Jesus for he will save the world from their sins. And as the story is told in Luke's gospel, Mary explodes with a poem and it's called the Magnificat which is Latin for it magnifies. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 46. And when you read this, and I'm going to invite you to read this poem, you'll see that this is not meek and timid little girly talk, okay? This is not junior high, like big into boys and doing her nails or posting the latest TikTok fad, okay? Notice the number of times where she quotes from the Hebrew scriptures. This girl knows her scriptures and her history. She knows what God has been about in the past. She knows the story she finds herself in. Oh, like if you're taking notes, take that note. She knows the story she finds herself in. Do you? Do you know the story that you're a part of? 
the grandness of that story? Or do you not know it and therefore you've had to write your own story and your own story is not very good? You're part of a bigger, better story. Mary knew that. So look at it, verse 46, Mary says, My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Notice the term, in God my Savior. For Mary, God was not detached from the real world. God is involved in human history because she knew her history. She knew the scriptures. God always in the past intervened and rescued her people. She knew that God was going to come on the scene and take care of Caesar and take care of Herod. Mary's God was in the midst of concrete reality. Flesh, blood, taxes, economy, wars, struggles, debt, unemployment, COVID. Look what he says, verse 48, or what she says, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. This is a quote from the Psalms. In fact, seven quotes from the Psalms in this poem. And the Psalms were the songbook of Israel. You sang the Psalms. Like, like Kiss Country or Prime Country didn't really work for Mary. She sang the songs of her doctrine, of her faith, of her God. Wait a minute. Is your 14-year-old daughter singing songs of faith? Or is she singing songs of hip, gyrating, synthetic pop yuck? And look at what she says, verse 50. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. I, I, I like how Thomas Cahill writes it. The Magnificat is the most muscular poem in all of ancient literature. This isn't a girl who says, whatever. This is a girl who says, God is going to come on the scene and do something huge. Notice that she sang or, or she writes, he scatters the proud. That, that's not in the Hebrew scriptures. <laughs> this was Mary's own faith. This was her own conviction of the kind of God who was now being birthed in her virgin womb. Let's read on to the end, verse 52. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Here's this worldwide empire, England to India, crushing anybody on its path. And Mary says, <laughs> that's not a problem to my God. God has been watching. Yes, he's been waiting, but he's also been watching. And now is the time. And Cahill writes, no one knows it yet, but the poor and the hungry and the humiliated have won and this unknown 13-year-old is their unexpected representative. I don't know what age you are when you're watching this. But if you're a 13 or a 14-year-old, you could be God's unexpected representative. Whoa. Oh. I love it. I love it. Mary says... I know that Caesar is sitting on a big throne with a big sword. And I know Herod is still overtaxing us and ruining our lives. But in my womb, <laughs> I've got me a baby. And I'm the Lord's servant. Let's get on with it. So you can talk to me about vast armies and powerful rulers and thrones. But his kingdom, the kingdom of the baby in my womb, is going to go on forever and forever and even longer. To which I might add an historical footnote. Herod's kingdom is a pile of rocks. You can view it on a trip. Caesar 
is a series of pictures in the history books of men in togas. And you and I are here this morning to celebrate Jesus' kingdom. So apparently, like Mary, we're on to something. And that's the point. That's the honesty and the realness that we mentioned at the beginning of this message. The original Christmas was set in a difficult, oppressed, despairing situation, but God entered and he valued a teenage girl birthing in her faith and hope and a valuing of herself. And today, today, the 2020th Christmas, you are invited into the Christmas story to discover that still today, God intervenes into the difficult, the waiting, the time when we're wondering, where are you, God? And even more, even more, even greater, you're invited into the Christmas story to discover that still today, God values ordinary people. And if God values you, then perhaps you can value yourself. Your value is not determined by your circumstances, even pandemic circumstances. It's not determined by the circumstances imposed upon you, whether because of your race or your economics or your educational opportunities or your health coverage, although too often they're interrelated or due to our ignored or overlooked systemic injustices and and inequality. But, But your value is not determined by your economic status or your employment status or your marriage status or your income status or your social status. The baby born birthed a new kind of kingdom, the kingdom of God. And life in that kingdom sees reality, even the harshest, most challenging, difficult realities from a very different perspective. That's why my dear friend John, you call him Pastor John, with cancer in his body for the second time, smiles every day. It's why David, my friend, with only one pair of shoes, living in a room 10 foot by 10 foot in a slum, sleeping on a concrete damp floor, loved and cared for the children he saw every day in the slum that he grew up in. And although he could have left the slum because he got a high school qualification and a college qualification, he chose to stay to empower children out of the little hell that they're living in. It's why Jean, who with little food in her kitchen cupboards, living on a state pension, wouldn't ever let me leave her home without her going into the pantry and taking out maybe even her last parts of groceries and putting them in a bag and saying, Gilbert, you have them. It's why Cynthia, with beautiful looks and great personality, doesn't give in to peer pressure to sleep around until she finds the right husband. It's why Bill well on in his years and with only himself for company having been widowed for many, many years. Doesn't give up and throw in, the, throw in the towel and throw a pity party, but he keeps his mind sharp and he writes cards of prayers and appreciation that he sends to younger men and fathers and leaders and pastors all around the country every single week. Christmas, Christmas. Caesar doesn't have the last word. Herod doesn't have the last word. God does. And that word is so frequently in the strangest of settings, through the strangest of people, in the strangest of ways. So as we head to Christmas, is there someone, a friend, a colleague, a family member, or maybe yourself? And you or they need to be reminded this Christmas, who has the last word? Is there someone, maybe you, and you need to know that the ending is sure. There is one king and there is one kingdom that will always be. And those that follow that king will always be there as well. Is there someone, and it's maybe you, and you need to find yourself in the first Christmas story and choose the faith path, the trust path, the boldness path, 
the victory path that that teenage girl Mary chose. I'm going to pray. And as I pray, may you let your whispers of distress or despair or fear or worry, let those whispers come up before God. And may you receive from him what only God can give. Let's pray. Unto us was born a Savior. A Savior who not only saves us from our sins, which will one day see us reach heaven, but he saves our souls and he saves our lives and he saves us at this very minute in time. And so, God, we bow. And in our reality, whatever it might be that is attacking or oppressing or destroying or, or coming against us, may we see and know you as our Savior this day, this Christmas, this COVID 2020. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. May God be with you this Christmas season as Pastor John preaches his final messages before his retirement and as you get a chance to bid him farewell as he enters into that well-earned retirement. And I look forward to speaking with you again come January 2021. May God bless you. Take care. Bye-bye. i